Woodworking is often billed as a return to nature, a retreat to a simpler time. Images of handsaws and drilling braces might come to mind when thinking of this great pastime. Where's Grandpa? Oh, he's out back whittling logs into chair legs. The reality is that once you step into a shop and learn the complexities that come with woodworking, well, that's when you learn that you've taken only a tiny step into a much larger arena. Take finishing, for example. There are practically an infinite number of ways to preserve and enhance the hard work that was once put into a project. Even the method to apply a finish is unique and requires a little more finesse than the hammering that went into the production. Today, let me show you some tips that I've used that have helped me when it's time to finish a project. Like my last full-size tip video, I've indexed each of the tips so that you can easily move on if you've already seen the tip. I've also got links you'll find in the description that go along with the video. Let's get this show on the road. The flame that burns inside myself. Flaws can be hidden in your wood and sometimes pop out when you add your finish. It's frustrating because now you have to strip your finish or stain and start over, or just accept that you'll notice that painful flaw every time you look at it. If you want to be absolutely sure that your surface is free of mistakes, head over to the toy section in your local box store and grab a box of sidewalk chalk. These large concrete graffiti sticks are easy to hold and only take a few swipes over your project. Adding a couple swipes will color the raised parts and reveal lower mistakes. After you've added it, check for gouges, divots, planer and jointer snipe and blade cuts, cross grain scratches, and any other difficult to see errors waiting to surprise you later on. When you're done, use tack cloth, a high grit sandpaper, or even an air hose to blow it off. You can get a box of these surprise eliminators for a few dollars and they're long lasting. Due to the natural pigments in wood, creating vibrant color patterns can be difficult. Because of maple's very light appearance, you could use it and only it when you want to stain something. But if you'd like more pronounced figure in your overall look, like this ash, try bleaching your wood first. You'll need two chemicals, sodium hydroxide and hydrogen peroxide, which can be bought in a wood bleaching kit from your local hardware store. The process goes like this. You'll spray on your sodium hydroxide and allow it to sit for about 10 minutes before adding the second part. When you add this second step, you'll notice a lot of foaming, which is good because you know it's working. Finally, I use a vinegar mixture to neutralize the surface. I'll add my dyes once I've allowed the wood to dry. The only thing I don't like about this store brand stuff is the cost and that it can take several coats to work due to how fresh the chemicals are, which is why I make my own at home. If you're interested in clear step-by-step -step instructions to make your own solution at home, including the neutralizer part three recipe that's not included in the store version, I have a link in the description below. The simplest way to finish a project, usually without fail, is by using an oil finish. The oil soaks into the fibers, creating deep, colorful patterns that highlight both the wood's chatoyance as well as figure. If you're new to woodworking, this is where I'd start. But the problem that oils have is that they do very little to actually protect the wood they're covering. Danish oil, which is a fusion of oil and varnish, does a pretty good job of enriching the wood, but still isn't enough to keep the dirt away, and it isn't great with moisture. Some will suggest adding multiple layers of Danish oil, but you're looking at several days to finish a project as each coat takes up to 24 hours to dry. Recently, I started using Danish oil, but instead of adding a couple coats, I allow it to dry over the 24 hour time period and add a layer of paste wax. It's not like adding a layer of polyurethane, but it does a much better job at repelling water and it can also be buffed for an incredible luster. If you're still tossing money at Wipe On Poly, there's something you need to know about it. Wipe On Poly is actually a watered down version of regular polyurethane. The difference is that you'll actually pay more for that watered down poly over the thicker polyurethane. Talk about a con chasing a con. If you're looking for ways to save money and who isn't these days, there's an easier way to make your own at home. First, you'll need a glass jar, preferably with a lid. You'll need either mineral spirits or paint thinner in a measuring cup. Add three parts poly to one part thinning agent. And that's it. The best part is that you can experiment with different thicknesses depending on different wood densities. For example, with this curly maple, I wanted to bring out the chatoyance of the wood by getting a layer deeper into the wood. I added a little more paint thinner, which allowed the poly to become thin enough to penetrate deeper into the dense maple. Save money and build a better finishing skill set. Much better than the con chasing the con. 
A common problem that comes with finishing a project is the finishing part. There are a variety of ways to finish a project, but usually most of those methods end up discoloring the wood. If you're staining, this isn't an issue, but if you like your wood to look as close to how it looked after breaking it down from rough stock, I've got a tip for you. Instead of heading to the finished section of your hardware store, head to the metal polishing aisle and pick up a stick of white rouge. White rouge or blizzard compound has very fine particles that are added that help to sand your stock so that it's incredibly smooth. The waxy substance the particles are embedded into when hot becomes a clear substance that melts into your stock, creating a moisture and dirt barrier. To use white rouge, I add it to my lathe projects and crank up the speed using a cloth to finish. The same can be done with a buffer or even buffer attachments that fit into your drill. If you do use buffing equipment, it should never be used on metal, which can stain your stock. You should always only use cotton or muslin buffs as well. We are, after all, adding a very fine finish with this process. For stick of the stuff, I have a link in the description below. A very old trick for finishing a large project is to hammer nails into a bunch of small pads. In this way, you can finish, stain, or paint every side of a project without having to wait for each side to dry and cure. This is a great method when you're going through the finished process, but it's terrible when it's time to put these things away. They take up so much space as they don't stack well, which is a problem as every tool should have its place in your garage. Instead, we'll redesign them so that they're offset on each block. To make six of these, we'll cut half inch plywood into two inch by two inch pieces. We'll find the center of each and drill it out with a five sixteenths inch drill bit and draw a line through the center of one side. Now we'll cut to the center with either a table saw or a band saw. The cuts will need to be thick enough that the business end of a nail will fit the slot. We'll drill a hole on the other side of the cut and add our nail. Now it's easy to nest these guys, but wait, to store them, we'll run a quarter inch bolt through the center of another drilled block and string them all together. Now it's easy to use and store a set of these. If you've ever finished a project, especially with spray paint or polyurethane, and found a missed spot, it can be frustrating as it means you'll have to wait another dry cycle to call your project done. I've got a couple options you can make that will make it easier to see every top 3D angle. The simplest method is to grab a Lazy Susan. You can find them at just about any hardware store, and it doesn't take but five minutes to throw a piece of plywood on the top of it and add a couple screws. Once it's done, you can put it on any surface and spin your plywood as you spray, doing a final spin to make sure everything is done. The second option is to make this dog hole finish board that has a pipe that can fit in any three quarter inch hole on your bench. It has grippy pads made from carpet runner that allows you to easily sand your project. Flip the pads over and you have set screw points that hold your project above the surface so that not only can you spin to see every angle, but you can finish one side and flip the project to do the other. This is my favorite way to work with cutting boards and it really doesn't take much to make it. If you're interested in it, I have full step-by-step -step plans. ever opened a can of old polyurethane, found a thick skin that's formed at the top and wondered where the scab came from, simply put, it's the air inside of the container that's the villain. We talked about that same air problem back in number 12, when we leave our glue bottles right side up. The air can cause the glue to dry inside of the bottle, creating problems with our cap and glue tip. To solve this problem and to preserve your finishes well beyond their expiration dates, grab a stop loss bag from Amazon. These things are amazing. The finishes are poured into each of the bags. Add a few marks to the front of the bag to identify the liquid and pour out what you need. When you're finished, squeeze the air out and add the cap. These bags eliminate the dangers that some finishes like boiled linseed oil can create as they react to oxygen. Remove the oxygen, remove that hidden danger. Finishes have two different purposes, to enrich or color wood and to become a protective barrier. Today we'll look at the latter. In order for a protective barrier to be achieved, finishes are designed to dry. This is great when we want them to, not so great when we don't. Back in 54, we talked about using stop loss bags to prevent finishes from drying out. But what if you bought the bags after you bought your finishes? Well, we'll need to make sure that before we transfer it to one of these pouches, our finish is purified, sorting any dried bits out. You'll need a clean Pringles can or something similar, a nylon sock, a quarter inch dowel, duct tape, and a clean container to transfer your finish to. After cutting the bottom of the can off, we'll add four quarter inch holes that are nearly parallel to each other and string the dowels through. We'll slide our hose in and allow it to hang outside by about an inch and add the tape to secure it. Now put your newly created finished purifier over the new clean container and start the procedure. At this point, you can pour it back into the original can after it's been cleaned, or you can grab one of these stop loss bags and store it there. And I can't begin to tell you how much I love these stop loss bags and how much I recommend them. 
Wood glue, staining, and finishes all work through a process that's known as evaporation. In other words, water and oils need to dry. Sometimes in the case of wood glue, we set projects to dry as they're held together with clamps. With gluing finished, we clean things up. Other times, like both staining and finishing, there may be several different timed uses for brushes before the project is completed. Cycling through layers of cleaning and using paintbrushes, for example, means we need to wait for the paintbrush to be dry before we can use it again for the next layer. Knowing all of this, we do have the means to manipulate the drying process with our brushes and rollers. Instead of washing them out, keep a box of gallon-sized Ziploc bags in your shop next to your finish table. When it's time to wait before adding a new layer, drop the brush or roller into the bag and zip it closed. Since heat is another part of the drying process, I keep my brushes and rollers in bags in my refrigerator until I need to use them again. Besides eliminating several cleanup times, it also prevents dry particles from getting on the surface and in my joints. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this gives you a few ideas. If so, please leave a comment below and let me know. A big thank you to my patrons that helped me remove the stubborn paste wax lids. I'd like to welcome both Aubrey and Nukebert and encourage you to be a part of the team. You can find a link to my Patreon in the description down below. Thank you. Michelle B, Keith Current, William L. McNally, Jerry Adams, Zach Finch, Rich Lightfoot, Tudor the Barbarian, Mike Lornitis, Les N, Gary G, Aubrey G, and Nukebert. Hit the thumbs up, subscribe, and ring that bell. And I thank you so much for being a part of my shop. Please leave a comment below. Come find me on Instagram at Make Things with Rob. And remember to keep making things. Inside myself